The way we talk about fat people is never right. It isn't. They tiptoe around words and phrases, and that's because they're fat people, and we don't want them to be offended. They assume fat people have had a hard life, which makes their fatness more excusable to the unfat. So they start using words that actually sound much worse than if they just said fat. Chubby, big person, bigger person, big boned, large, fluffy, hefty, overweight, or the worst one of all, obese. What the hell does that even mean? I'll tell you what it means. It's just a fancy way for a doctor to get away with calling me fat. People try to be cautious with what they say and how they talk about bigger people. That is, until they're not. In fact, I'd argue we say anything we want about them, definitely behind their backs and sometimes even to their face. And I should know, because I was one, a fatty. A fatty, fatty, fat, fat. A fat person. That's right. Look at old Chubbs McGee up there. What a fatty. So I get it. I've heard it all, the good and the bad, and people really just don't know how to talk about fat people. They have no idea. Is that what they're called? Are we allowed to say fat? You know, some of my best friends are fat. And even saying fat people out loud makes skinny people tense up. And we can see it happen because you're so skinny and methy looking. <laughs> say fat people and skinny people always start to look around the room for the fat people. It's like what white people do when someone says black people. And everyone will always deny they do this. I don't scan the room for black people or fat people. That's ridiculous. I love Lizzo. <laughs> we are awful to fat people. And I'm forced to include myself in that we because I'm smaller now. But no matter how small I get, I still think like a fat person. And I definitely still notice every little thing about weight and things weight adjacent. Think about any time you go to a restaurant. If you see a fat person, what do you do? You judge what they're eating. Doesn't matter what it is. They could be eating a salad, and you're thinking, too late. It's too late for that salad. That salad was like 10 years ago. Just get the steak. Do it. Come on. Get the steak, the loaded baked potato, the chocolate cake. Come on. We all know you want the steak. Just get it. And then what happens if they're eating the steak? Fat ass. You're going to die right there at the table, aren't you? We all do it. Even fat people. I did it when I was fat, and now I do it that I'm skinnier. When I was little... I was very skinny, very skinny. I used to suck in my stomach and people would joke you could see my spine. I never thought about being a bigger person because with how skinny I was, it just didn't seem realistic. I mean, my mom was fat. She was actually very big. And it was something she battled her, her, her whole life, which caused her massive depression. She never wanted me to go through that, but she was also a baker and would always bake cakes for every occasion. Birthdays, Christmas, the Super Bowl, Tuesdays, it didn't matter. <laughs> If she had the itch, she started to bake, and her cakes were good, so damn good. She won awards for those beautiful fluffy cakes. And trust me, by 13, I had eaten a lot of cakes. And by the time I hit 13, you could see that I had eaten a lot of cakes. It started with the belly. I'd never had one before. It just kind of popped up out of nowhere. In fact, it happened so quickly, my mom took me in for testing to see if something was wrong with me. The doctors found nothing, but the trip itself was tasking and definitely deserved a cake. <laughs> the weight packed on a little slower during the high school years since I was always pretty active with basketball, skateboarding, and theater. I was always on the go. I got up to about 215 pounds, which didn't seem too terrible, I guess, for a teenager who was six foot tall. And I was also always willing to make fun of my bumbling belly, and that made me charmingly chubby. So it all just never really messed with me. And I had no reason to think the weight was going to stick. My family would often toss it off as baby fat I would grow out of because I was tall, which made sense because I was tall. More cake. However, by the time I graduated high school, beer and burritos replaced the extracurriculars. The slow weight gain became a little more steady, but I also began performing on stage almost every day doing a show that demanded a lot of physical comedy. I'd still play some basketball, so all in all, going from around 215 pounds to 245 pounds in a couple of years didn't seem all that bad. Then in my 30s, I realized that getting drunk and eating burritos was pretty much my favorite thing to do. So I did it every night. Also, did you know when you're an adult, you can just eat donuts whenever you want? No one can tell you no. Did you know that? <laughs> and if you're an adult and you work in a setting that sucks, then people bring in donuts all the time so that you and your coworkers don't go insane and murder everyone. I can see it now. That little pink bakery box. What power it holds. 
especially if you brought it in. You single-handedly saved lives with that pink bakery box. Everyone loves you, unless you got those donuts with the nuts on them. What the fuck is that? Why would you do that? You're an idiot, Tammy. No one likes nut donuts. At the ripe old age of 33, the age they killed Christ, my diet was pretty much donuts, beer, burritos, and an occasional deli sandwich, so I could essentially say I ate healthy once a week. I got big. I got fat. By 36, I was 275 pounds. At one point, I hit 281. It just never occurred to me it was happening, but it was. I could definitely feel it. My clothes started to get uncomfortably tight, and I found myself doing the pull and tug for every shirt I'd put on. I could also feel my breathing changing. I became painfully aware that my diet of bread and sugar probably wasn't good for me. I basically lived in black and baggy clothes to hide the emerging roles. People would always be shocked when I told them how much I weighed. It didn't make sense to them. I was a pretty mobile guy. I could move and pratfall and dance. Oh, holy shit, can I dance? Like a fat, drunk Bruno Mars, which is still good because Bruno Mars is a fucking fantastic dancer. People would always say, you carry your weight so well. And I did. To them, not to me. I was somehow able to trick them and even trick a much younger and much more attractive woman into marrying me. And that's not just me being kind. She wasn't as those things, because although I was fat, I somehow never had a problem dating out of my league. <laughs> she is hot and smart, and I am funny and chubby. That's the dynamic. <laughs> She'd notice that I'd spend my nights avoiding the mirror when I changed. I'd wear shirts in the pool or beach or near any body of water just in case. I hated seeing myself unless I had clothes on. I just didn't know how it could have gotten to this. In our bedroom in the house we were living in at the time, the bed lined up perfectly with the large mirror in our bathroom. So when I'd wake up every morning, I'd turn and sit up and be positioned perfectly to look to my right and see this weird Hershey's kiss shape my body had taken. I felt and looked deflated. FYI, and fat people can back me up here, sitting is our worst look. Standing is best, but also the hardest, so laying down is preferred. But nothing makes us look fatter than sitting. Well, that and wearing a wetsuit. Every morning, I'd wake up and see this teardrop-shaped version of myself. I would get sad. I would get depressed every morning. So I'd have pancakes and donuts and cookies and beer and pasta and cake and anything else I wanted. Then I'd get depressed that I was eating so shitty, which was the reason I was eating so shitty in the first place. I became addicted to these foods because they helped alleviate my depression, which I never really knew I had. Because when you're funny and charming, people just always assume everything is great when really the opposite is almost always true. So if I was sad, I would eat, then get sad at what I was eating, then get depressed at how I looked. So I'd just go to sleep, then wake up. Oops, teardrop in the mirror. Donuts, cake, beer, sleep, teardrop. Repeat and repeat and repeat. Then I pulled my back out reaching for a french fry. I was eating dinner with my much younger and much more attractive wife. And on this night, she sat across from me while, I, while my back seized up, reaching my hand into a bag, trying to get the last couple of French fries. I stiffened like a board. I couldn't speak. The pain was unbearable. My wife thought I was having a heart attack, and rightfully so. Here's an almost 300-pound man who just seized up after eating a giant cheeseburger and fries, and she was scared. I was scared. It was time to do something. Oddly enough, I'd always liked running, so I decided to start jogging, jogging on my lunch breaks. For a couple of weeks, it felt great. In fact, I found the same release of joy from physical exercise as I did from food. It was amazing. Then one day, I went to shower after a run, and my chest started to hurt. I felt a sharp pain near my heart, and I got dizzy. I sat down, and I was able to catch my breath and right the ship. But for the first time, I legitimately thought I was going to die. Right there at work, with that pink bakery box still in view. I would die. I made an appointment with my doctor immediately. He ran some tests and told me everything looked okay. There was a slight hiccup in my EKG, so he wanted to schedule a stress test with cardiology. I said, okay. And then he called them and told them to give me the next available appointment, which was four months away. My doctor told me I needed to lose some weight. However, until the stress test, I shouldn't do any strenuous activity. Then how do I lose weight if the test is four months away, Mr. Smarty Pants Doctor? He told me to change up my diet of donuts and beer and cake and burritos. <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> of course, that doctor's visit was very difficult, and it deserved some sympathy donuts as a reward. So did the next day, and the next, and the next. 
Instead of jumping into a diet, I jumped into the thought that I now had four months until I actually needed to do anything. That weekend, we had plans to attend the Scottish Highland Games, where they throw tree trunks and hay bales and all the stuff you've always assumed Scottish people do. <laughs> Ray and Angela, a couple we knew that were competing in the games, invited us. Angela was a bigger person, and Ray seemed to be fairly fit. They were extremely nice and told me I should compete in the games sometimes. I agreed. I mean, why wouldn't I want to throw a tree trunk? I then did the patented, gotta lose a few pounds first. Everyone chuckled except Ray, who said if I was serious about it that we should talk. A month later, teardrop, donuts, beer, sleep. My wife, my much younger, much more attractive wife, who had seen me seize up and thought I was having a heart attack reaching for a french fry, finally said something. I don't care how you look. Never a good start. I never have, I never will. I love you, but I want you to be there for our daughter. We can't lose you. Shit. <laughs> the next morning, I called Ray. He asked me, so you ready to lose weight? I said, yes, very ready. Then he asked me the most important question anyone's ever asked. Why? I gave him the usual answers you'd expect to be healthier for my family, etc. And he said, great. Now, why do you want to lose weight? I was stumped. Hadn't I just answered him? Ray started telling me how he'd lost 40 pounds in about four months through changing his diet. That's it. No heavy exercise, no tricks, no powders, just eating the right portions of the right food. No donuts or cake or beer or burritos. His wife, Angela, had battled with weight her entire life. She was diagnosed with a condition where she was unable to lose weight on any kind of significant level. She was placed on diet plan after diet plan from one doctor to that specialist and then finally developed her own plan. She didn't care how she looked. She wanted to be alive. She wanted to figure out how to still eat good food that was healthy and in turn make her healthy on the inside, fuck the outside. That, I yelled. That. That's why I want to do it. I don't care if I look better or different or lose pounds, although shit, that would be nice. But I want to live. I want to feel happy. I started the next week. After partaking in a farewell tour of an unbelievable amount of donuts and beer and cookies and burritos, it was like I was getting ready to hibernate. In the first two weeks, I lost 15 pounds. My goal was to get to 250 pounds. I did that in 45 days. In 45 days, I lost 24 pounds just by eating right. When I showed up to the stress test, I had lost 33 pounds, and I made sure to tell everyone there this fact over and over and over again. I can't tell you how laser-focused I was. I saw how proud my wife was when I turned down fries for apples and grapes. I saw how amazed my daughter was when I turned down my absolute favorite thing in the world, apple pie, so she ate mine. About a month after the stress test, I went into Old Navy. Trying on clothes when you're a bigger person is pretty much the worst. It's playing a game of Russian roulette with your feelings. I usually just bought a double XL and didn't care if it was too big or not. But now I was down 40 pounds, feeling good. I tried on a suit jacket. I went with the XL, because let's not get crazy. And it was too big. It was too fucking big. I ran on and got the L. The L, not as an L as in loser, but L's in motherfucking large. It fit perfectly. I stood in the mirror and I didn't see a teardrop shape me. Instead, I saw actual teardrops falling from my face. The attendant asked if I was okay, and I leapt out of the dressing room and said, this is a large and it fits, and she was scared. <laughs> when all was said and done, I dropped 81 pounds. I had high blood pressure for over a decade and had been on medication for it, but that was also now gone. People often asked, what changed? Why did you wake up one morning and decide to do it? And I can honestly say, I don't know. I have no idea. It could have been remembering how sad my mom always was about her health or maybe my near heart attack. There wasn't a light switch that went off or a starter pistol. It was a culmination of a hundred little things festering in my brain and my heart and my gut. And, you know, it was a Monday. I feel like I need to make two things very clear. One, this was, and I hate using this word because it makes me sound like I'm on The Bachelorette, my journey. Mine, specifically. I'm not telling this story because it should be yours or theirs. In fact, I don't really care what you do as long as you're happy. A lot of people find happiness in different ways when it comes to their body. Some people don't care one way or another. Some people are fitness fanatics. And some people are huge and they don't give a fuck. And that's all the right answer. <laughs> Two, when I was down about 50 pounds, I remember hearing a song by Not A Surf called Do It Again that I'd listened to probably about 200 times before. But this time, a lyric popped out as if I was just hearing it for the first time. Maybe this weight was a gift, like I had to see what I could lift. I didn't care that I was fat. I cared why I was fat. 
My weight was a byproduct of my eating habits, which was a byproduct of my depression. Teardrop, donuts, beer, sleep. The weight was a gift because now I had an answer. I may now be skinnier in my mind, but in my heart, I'm all fat, baby. <laughs> and don't ever let anybody tell you, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. Because those people have never had a maple glazed old fashioned donut from Peterson's Donut Corner in Escondido. <laughs> Thank you. Dallas McLaughlin. Everybody give it up.